Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our Bible study today. This is Crosswalk Church, and I'm Pastor Armand Agnew. We have been doing a series on the life of Christ, following His, uh, his footsteps, uh, trying to uh, uh, glean that uh, uh, information that we need to be stronger and better believers today. So we're going to jump right into our, our uh, study today, but what I want you to know is that uh, you can follow along. You can go to our website, crosswalkchurchopflorida.com, and uh, there you can go to the resources tab, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, you can download the manual and uh, update that manual every week. So uh, uh, feel free to, to download that so that you can uh, see all the notes and know where we're at. So today we are getting closer and closer to uh, Jesus coming to Jerusalem for the Feast of what? Does anybody remember? Yeah, the Feast of Passover. Uh, but right now we know that uh, Jesus has uh, gone into Perea from Judea out of uh, the Jerusalem area, and uh, he did that on purpose. Uh, the religious leaders didn't like him. They didn't like what was going on. And so he goes to Perea, and he's going to spend just a short time in Perea, but he's going to be all over the place. But uh, I'll show you. Let me just show you a time chart. Actually, I have two of those. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> man, we have a change in the weather here in Florida, man. It's like every other day the pollen's all over the place. So anyway. Uh, here's a chart that I found, and uh, uh, I, I kind of uh, I like it. It's a chronological table, and it shows the seasons of the year uh, that Jesus did what he did. So we know that he was uh, born in the winter around 5, 4 B.C. Uh, we know that Herod the Great's death was around March or April, 4 B.C., so he had to be born before that. Uh, the prefects began to rule over Judea and Samaria around... A.D. 6, we're starting to see a progression and a setting up of uh, Rome in the area. Uh, Christ goes to the temple at 12 years old during the Passover, and that was in April of, uh, of uh, 9, and April 29th of uh, 9 uh, A.D. Uh, Caiaphas becomes a high priest in A.D. 18. Pilate arrives in Judea around 26. Then John the Baptist starts his ministry around AD 29, as does Jesus. Uh, and that's around the summer or autumn of AD 29. Then Jesus goes uh, to the first Passover after he starts his ministry. Remember, when he was younger, they would make trips from, where did Jesus live? Nazareth. They would make that trip from Nazareth to Jerusalem every year for the Passover. And we know that. But his first Passover after he's begun his ministry is around April, th this uh, commentator put April 7th, around 30. So uh, go ahead and give me that next slide there. Then John the Baptist is imprisoned around 30 to 31. Uh, Christ's second Passover is uh, around April 25th, around, and we know that's the date because we can uh, go by the calendar and find out when the Passovers are, and that was in 31. Then John the Baptist's death uh, was in 31 or 32. We don't know. Some of these are uh, flexible. Uh, then he goes to the Feast of Passover in October of 31. Then the third Passover after his ministry around 32. Then he goes to the Feast of Tabernacles in September. We can start to see is is uh, uh, bringing down his last six months of his life uh, in the ministry in the flesh. So we know he goes to the Feast of Dedication in uh, December. Then in March, which we're going to start here in a couple of weeks, uh, we're, we're going to get it right up to that today, where he's going to make his uh, final trek into Jerusalem, into Judea. And then he's going to arrive in Bethany in uh, March of 28. <clears throat> Does anybody know what's going on in Bethany? All my church folks are here today. It's good to see everybody. What Bethany? What's Bethany famous for? Lazarus. So last week we talked about Mary and Martha and the Mary and Martha, uh, you know, personalities where uh, one was busy with task and working. The other one was forget the task. I'm going to go sit at the feet of Jesus. And uh, how many of y'all know that Mary had it together? OK, y'all are real quiet here today. Come on. I know it's warm outside, but we're going like up to 85 today. So I know y'all are thawed out. But uh yeah, Martha was more concerned about 
you know, taking care of the task at hand. We got to feed everybody. We got this, uh, you know, big group of people here. Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. We, we got to take care of this. And Martha, uh, Mary leaves Martha and goes and sits down at Jesus' feet. And uh, Martha gets mad about it. So how many of y'all relate to Martha? You got to get things done. Let me see your hand here. Okay, how many of y'all out there? What about Mary? How many of y'all, you know, forget the work? I just want to go to church. <laughs> I want to live in church. And so that's what we're seeing. So uh, <clears throat> here's the map. I'm going to give you the map this morning. Excuse me. <clears throat> trying to get this shook out of me. So uh, you can see all the different areas. You see uh, the Galilee over here. Uh, we know that Jesus lived in uh, uh, Nazareth. There's Capernaum. That was his home base. Sea of Galilee. We know that he had come down into uh, Judea a couple times and back through Samaria. Uh, Samaria, he talked to the woman at the well. Back in the Galilee, he spent most of his time here in the Galilee area. Then he made a little quick trip to Decapolis, and now he went back down to Judea, and he's in Perea for a small time right here. So he's going to be here in Perea. By the way, this is where it all kind of started. His ministry kind of started in Perea, and that started with his what? His water baptism. And John proclaims him, you know, here's the Messiah. Let me give you John 10, 40 and 42. And went again, away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized. So he's going back to the beginning. And he says, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. And many believed on him. So we know that Jesus is, uh, he's, ga he's gaining some momentum in his ministry. We know that there are people that are following him and uh, they're just, you know, hanging on every word that he has to say. Wouldn't you love to have lived back then? <clears throat> I would. Man, I'd just love to. Now, I know we're going to get to see Jesus in the future. I get all that. But, you know, it would have it, it been cool just to see some of the things that he was doing back in those days. So he's doing all these miracles. He's teaching about the kingdom of God. But uh, let me see if you, if you got this right with me today, church. Y'all remember over the last few weeks, uh, in the Galilee, he was proclaiming all a bunch about the what? The kingdom of God. That began to turn and he began to talk more about what? <clears throat> what he was about to do at the cross. It began to turn about what he was getting ready to face. He was getting ready to go and enter into his passion and die on the cross. And he began to talk to his disciples about a time where he would be offered up, that he was going to be crucified by the religious leaders. And this is where it went. Whew. Right over his head. They didn't get it. They didn't really understand. They were following him. It was a great thing. They still didn't get it and understand what Jesus uh, was doing or what he's all about. And I believe today there are a lot of people that still don't know what it's all about. Well, they don't really know what church is all about. To, the, to a lot of people, they just go to church because they're going to see their friends and they're going to hang out or there's a great coffee bar. And, you know, there's this, uh, you know, concert kind of thing with a rock star worship leader. And, man, it's all great. And they're, they're not focusing on Jesus is about to come back. But he's looking for a pure bride. Come on. Jesus is looking for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And so we are, our job as the church today is to prepare the bride for the coming of the Lord. And that means purity. So we're seeing a lot of things. Uh, once again, I, I'm going to be addressing these in the Shaken series uh, after this, uh, uh, later on in the morning in our second service. Uh, I don't want to go there to, uh, right now because I'll preach all my notes from that. But here's Luke 13, 22. And it says this. And he went through the cities and the villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. In fact, it says that his face was uh, towards Jerusalem. And what that means is he was looking to uh, what was going to happen during the Passover as he would become the lamb slain, the spotless uh, lamb. He was going to shed his blood. So he's looking towards being there for that Passover. And uh, here's some things that he does. He uh, heals a man on the Sabbath. So basically, he's going to go to, to uh, dinner at a Pharisee's house. Now, y'all know the Pharisees weren't really, you know, 
They were intrigued by him, but a lot of them hated him. They were plotting to kill Jesus, and they didn't like what he was doing. He was disrupting what they were doing. They didn't like it, and he offended them. I told you Jesus was the great offender, and if you're going to be a Christian and serve the Lord and really follow the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit in your life, you're going to be offended because we are all what? Sinners, and we all fall short of the glory of God. So we need to grab this today and understand, man, Jesus is all about, you know, getting us ready for eternity, that the kingdom of God is at hand. And uh, so he goes on and heals a man on Sabbath. How many of y'all know the Pharisees went nuts? They were really, really, they went crazy. And I believe Jesus, listen, everything Jesus did was on purpose. So he goes to the house of a Pharisee on the Sabbath, knowing that he's going to heal a blind man. You know what they're going to do? They're going to go crazy, man, because they're hypocrites. You know, they were all about the law and all about this. And, you know, they were holding this law as a weight on people. And they were walking around and they were doing what they wanted to do. And so Jesus did this to expose their hypocrisy, religious hypocrisy. And, uh, you know, we got to understand that there's a lot of religious hypocrisy. There are people that, you know, they're worshiping God on Sunday morning, man. Yeah, it, but the rest of the week, they're living like the devil. That should not be. That's religious hypocrisy. He goes on, he, he teaches on humility because as he came in, uh, if you know anything about how they sit, uh, though there were certain seats for certain people that may be important or whatever. And, you know, the Pharisees came, they were sitting on all the prominent seats. And uh, so Jesus starts talking about, uh, you know, the best seats and having friendship with the rich people, letting the rich people in front of the line and having favors and, and all this stuff. Listen, nothing's changed. Come on. Thousands of years later, it's still the same. <clears throat> Everybody wants to prominent seats. Everybody wants to look important. Everybody wants to, you know, uh, be the one that is uh, in control or, or whatever. You know, I'm going to, you know, I'm rich. I should, you know, the air about all that stuff. Just I think it makes God sick. I, I just really do. And then in um, verse 11 of Luke 14, he says this. And this is so good. Uh, go, uh, okay, here we go. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. In other words, if you try to make yourself something that you're not, if you're, you know, vying for the important places, well, maybe I'm whatever, you know, in the, in the community and, you know, I should be treated with, you know, my own parking spot for church and my own pew, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, I remember, I got to tell the story. I remember, uh, in Birmingham, uh, there was a, a lot of pews, and, and I get it. You know, people put their names on them and stuff. And uh, so when when we redecorated the church, the pews were falling apart. So uh, our pastor back then took those pews out. And some of those people went berserk. They were like, wait a minute, you can't do that. We bought that bench. We put it in the church. It needs to stay there. And, you know, especially the ones that were up front because it had their names on it. We, you know, come on. Come on, church. We're be we're bigger than that, amen. You know, I love what happened with my brother. My brother goes to a Catholic church there in uh, Punchatula, and he loves uh, his priest. You know, his priest is, is just—he was a uh, engineer turned into a priest. So, you know, I heard a couple of his messages. And, you know, it was it was good. He was he was a smart guy. But when they closed the original church, when I grew up in, um, they sold all the pews. And uh, so my brother bought this big, nice pew. He spent a lot of money on it. And he, he swears up and down it's one that we used to sit in all the time. It could have, I don't know. And uh, when the new priest came in, they wanted to, uh, he wanted to renovate the old church. And so he goes back and he asked everybody that bought the pew to bring them back and give them to the church. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you know, my brother was all good with it. He's like, man, you know, I'll do whatever because I, I want to see the best for everybody. You know, I, I want to do this. It, I mean, it, it, he paid a lot of money for this thing. And I said, well, yeah, I, I'm curious here. How many people actually brought the benches back? He goes, 100%. He said 100% of the people brought the benches back. They put them back in place to restore that building as a uh, memorial kind of. It was the first, you know, Catholic church in the area. So uh, I thought that was pretty good. I, I just think that's a good, uh, a pretty good example there. So uh, Jesus teaches on the great, uh, the great banquet. I love this uh, parable. He talks about the A-list. You know, he sends people out, this master, he's having a feast. 
I'm going to send my servants out and you go and get these people and this person and that person. And when they went to them, they all had an excuse. They were on the A-list. Oh, I can't make it. I got da 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 So finally, the, the, the master gets upset, tells the servants, go everywhere to the highway. How many of y'all remember this? Go to the highways, go to the byways, bring in anybody, anybody that wants to come, bring them in. He opened the doors up. And so he's talking about uh, the kingdom of God. He's saying, you know what? Uh, the religious leaders were the ones that rejected him. Basically, that's what he was saying. Those that, you know, think they should be in there. And how many of y'all know he's just smacking it to the religious leaders? He's telling them the truth. Something we need to be doing today. We need to be talking about the truth. Somebody say amen. amen. So he, then he begins to challenge the multitudes. And uh, if you're following along and you have the notes, you can see all these are in there. Uh, but Jesus' popularity is increasing, and so do the crowds. The multitudes are following him as he draws near to Jerusalem. Now, how many of y'all know that the priest wanted all the people to follow them? They wanted to be the person. We want to be the mega whatever. And now you're following this guy. Uh, we don't like that. We don't like him. You know, they, they were getting very, very upset about this. And I like it. I like the fact that God was shaking. That's the, my uh, message series, the shaking. God was shaking things up, man. He was starting with the religious people. And then it went on out from there. So uh, Jesus is being drawn to Jerusalem because he knows he has an appointment. He has an appointment with the cross. Now, I want you to understand, and we're going to get into this over the next few weeks, uh, Easter's only about a month away. Can y'all believe that? Easter is almost a month away. They like saving time is coming up. How many of y'all, yeah, I'm loving, I like it when it's, you know, light till like 8 o'clock at night. I'm into that. I love that. So, but anyway, uh, he's going uh, to uh, Jerusalem, and he stops and he teaches along the way, and he goes in Luke 14, 27, and he says this, and he's being really upfront with the people, those that are following him. Listen, Jesus didn't care if they followed him or not. If you were going to follow the Lord like today, you need to do his word, and it may not be popular. It's not going to be popular, but look at Luke 14, 27, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So there's a cross that we need to bear. And that is like, you know, the way I look at it is that we need to, uh, to give our burdens to the Lord. Our cross is our walk in God. Our ability to allow the Holy Spirit to change us. Uh, it's that cross that we bear to bring the word out. I'm going to be talking about uh, the, uh, the things that the church needs to be doing in this hour. So if you're watching this, you want to tune into the next service because uh, times are getting bad. They're getting crazy. Liberal stuff is all over the place. But I'm going to talk about the things that the church, what they're supposed to be doing. They should have been doing it. We should still be doing it no matter what. And I'm going to, I'm going to preach that one later on. I want to preach it now, but I can't. So then he talks about salt and how when salt loses its favor, all these things are, uh, you're starting to see the, 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 the timeline on when he says these things. And uh, he talks about when salt loses its uh, savor, it's no good. It doesn't do anybody any good. And so he uh, illustrates the fact that the church is salt and light too, and that we are here for one reason and one reason only, to make people thirsty for God. Amen. Come on. Your life should be making people thirsty for God. They should be looking at your life going, man, what do you have? I want that. You know, it should be that, that flavor that, uh, you know, draws people to the cross the uh, words and the actions coming out of your mouth should be those. Listen, there's one of two things needs to happen when, when you live for God and you're out there on the streets. And I've seen both. One, they're either going to get saved or two, they're going to walk away. Come on. But you've done your job. You've done what you needed to do. Now he's going to enter into uh, to the parables of seeking the lost. And uh, once again, the uh, Pharisees and scribes uh, they despise publicans and sinners. And Jesus is going to go hang out. It says he's going to go to where the publicans and the sinners are. How many of y'all know who the publicans were? April 15th is coming up. Well, the tax collectors. Yeah, Rome was smart. They would get Jews. They would hire them. Uh, yeah, who was the tax collector that followed Jesus? We know his name. He's very, very well known. Levi, Yeah. 
And so we know that uh, they, in those days, when Rome hired a Jew to go and collect the taxes, they could collect the taxes plus whatever they wanted. How many of y'all know that they can be a little unscrupulous with that? There's no boundaries. So, you know, Elizabeth, you know, you owe Rome uh, $2,000, but $3,000 and we'll call it a deal. You won't go to jail. How's that sound? No, it doesn't sound very good. So uh, he's going to use three parables about the lost. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Somebody say amen. It was his reason for coming. He's, he's making a bridge uh, between God and man so that man can have eternal life. He is that bridge. Give me slide 11. Let me just show you these right quick. Uh, there are three of them. And uh, here they are. Uh, the first one is the lost sheep. In verse 7, he says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. More than 99 just persons which need no repentance. So he's talking about the lost sheep, how the shepherd would go and find uh, the lost, that one that has strayed, because the other 99 were uh, contained, they were safe. And he talks about the lost coin in verse 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So you got to understand this today. When you go to church or uh, you're in your service and you are uh, in an altar call and somebody gets saved, it says all of heaven begins to rejoice and praise God. That You know, we take salvation so much for granted. Come on. Don't we do that? We just take, you know, we take it so lightly. Salvation has just been, you know, kind of a buzzword. Nobody even talks about that anymore. I just go to this church or that church. But understand this, when someone gets saved, the angels in heaven begin to have a party. Come on, they begin to celebrate. That's a good celebration. Then he talks about the lost son. This is a really long one. And he goes on and says, uh, It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Everybody knows the story about the prodigal son, how he took his dad's, uh, his, por his portion of the inheritance and left. And anyway, I won't go into all that, but, you know, the part of that story I really like is that the father would go out every day and he would look down that road and he was like, I hope today's the day that my son comes home. I hope that this is the day that he will come and we will embrace him. And it's the same thing with God the father. Every day he's looking down the road and he's, he's hoping someone will accept him and come unto him through Christ Jesus. Come on. It's the same thing. You know, I was lost, but now I'm found. Amen. How many of y'all are glad you found? Amen. Now he's going to go into some teachings. And once again, following those notes, I'll give you all the verses there. But uh, one of the things he talks about is stewardship. Listen, I've had people uh, leave church, not just this church, but other churches, because they got tired of the offering. Whoever is receiving the offering makes me feel guilty that I'm not giving. You know, and I, I, I don't want that. I don't feel guilty. I don't want to be just... Listen, stewardship's up to you. It's whatever you want to do, but we're going to tell you the truth about it. I don't ask for money, so I ask one of my board members to come up. and <laughs> He's over there laughing. I get my board. <laughs> give me your, no. Listen, I don't even know what, who's tithing or what. I'll let the board take care of that. And uh, So they, they do it scripturally. But listen, we, we do it in the, in the fact that God wants to bless you, but it's in your uh, you know, hands to open God's hands. And you have to do that by the word obedience. So we're going to look at uh, stewardship. Let me give you a couple of verses about stewardship. Luke 16, 10 says this. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So stewardship is basically about God's going to give us something. Everybody here, everybody out there, God has given you something to take care of. Now, are you going to just hide it somewhere and sit on it like a lot of people do? Or are you going to do what, what God gave you and, and make whatever it is, whatever that is? Not everybody can pastor a mega church. It's just not going to happen. Uh, not everybody's going to, uh, you know, go on the mission field. It's just not going to happen. But maybe God has called you to work the nursery. Please don't say that word nursery. We're having enough trouble with all this stuff about nursery. Listen, even picking up paper around your church is a ministry. Come on, somebody say amen in the house today. Even pick it up the trash, uh, clean it, come up, whatever, you know. And what God is going to do, he's going to see how faithful you are in that small thing that we think is insignificant. 
And uh, it was part of our training there at, at the church in, at Cathedral. People wanted to come, but they all wanted to preach and lead this big class and stuff. And we had them setting up chairs way before uh, they were allowed to do anything. We had to see if they were going to be good stewards of what God had. So the next one is this. It says, no servant, Ebbie, thank you. No servant can serve, <clears throat> excuse me, two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You just cannot do it. Put that slide back up for me, Sarah. Look what it says. You cannot serve God and mammon. What does that mean? It means this. It means you can't really serve God and money or the world's system or the world's idea. You can't have two masters. There's just no way. Listen, you're either going to serve God today or you're not. It's just as clear as can be. There's no gray area there. There's no gray area. You either love Jesus and you're born again and you're serving him or you're not. There's only two masters, God and the devil. You got to serve one of them. How many of y'all remember that old song? Uh, what's his name used to, to sing? You got to serve somebody. Bob Dylan. You got to, you know, he said he was a singer, but I'm not sure about that. I think the jury's still out on that. But he wrote a lot of good lyrics. <laughs> and he said, you got to serve somebody. Well, it may be the Lord or, you know, but you're going to serve somebody. Now, I'm going to give you one here that uh, really, really is a tricky uh, verse. A lot of people don't like this verse. Uh, especially in our society today. And I'm going to tell you why God places it where he places it. It's, a, it's an obscure verse that's placed in the middle of, uh, you know, discipleship and being uh, loyal to God and serving God. And this is where the verse is. It's found in Luke 16, 18. It says this. Uh, by the way, it is divorce. Divorce is, just, let me tell you why. Divorce is despised by God as it is symbolic of our relationship with the Lord. The reason that he put that in there is that he's equating that when you uh, divorce in, in your life. Now, once again, let's go live. Let me just give you my disclaimer. Now, I know some of y'all are, are divorced. I get that. I understand. I'm not your judge. Uh, I'm going to tell you like I've heard it preached before is that, hey, if you're divorced and remarried, stick with the one you got. Don't be jumping around. The reason is because divorce is a covenant. Salvation is a covenant. We, we've kind of watered down both of those. But when we're born again, we enter into a covenant with God. Somebody say amen. It's a, a very, very big covenant. And when we walk away from God, then we divorce God. And that's not a good thing. God, you broke the covenant. So marriage is a covenant. We need to really, really get back pastors to uh, uh, counseling these young people that want to get married. And, you know, with the divorce rate in the church at 50%, there's something going on there. And the biggest thing is I'm not compatible. Well, you know, yeah, you, nope. Come on. You need somebody to talk to you before you before you say the high dues, amen? Come on. Well, you know what? <clears throat> divorce is actually going down. And does anybody know the reason? They're living together. Yeah, which is sin. It is fornication. It's outside of the confines of the biblical marriage. Now, I know I'm going to get a lot of good, you know, uh, cards and letters from that one, remarks, whatever. Hey, you know, you're old-fashioned, stuck in the mud. You're a hater. Da, 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 da. I don't care. Here's what it says. <laughs> in Luke 16, 18, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marry another committeth adultery. And whosoever marries her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Now, once again, I'm going to say this. If you're a believer and you're remarried, I get it. You just keep going. You keep serving God. You're all right. Uh, but I do want to share this story because there was a, uh, did a lot of counseling, still do counseling. And there was a couple came to us and uh, the husband was trying to reconcile, make things right. He came in, he did the right thing. Finally talked his wife who wanted out of the marriage. They had like six kids. I don't, I don't remember. They had a lot of children. And uh, they came in and they sat down and he was weeping, man. He was in my office. He was just weeping, weeping. I don't want a divorce. I don't want a divorce. And she wouldn't even look at me or him. She just sat there with her head like this. She wouldn't say anything until we got her turn. And when she got her turn, she just started spewing all the stuff that he wasn't. But she wasn't happy. And this is what she said. I know that God will forgive me. 
Well, and I told her this. I said, yeah, maybe God's going to forgive you, but it's going to affect things. It's going to affect the children. It's going to affect you. It's going to affect your life. Well, it, it was never re really resolved. She left, made it in her her mind that it was over, and she did. She divorced him. Then she married somebody else in the church who was divorced. And uh, <clears throat> they were there for a little while. It wasn't, it wasn't but just a few months. Uh, he came in by himself. He was crying. He was talking to one of the other pastors. She had already divorced him. And it was just, it, it, you know, and as far as I know right now, that, that lady still does not serve God. Listen, there are consequences for sin. Come on. Especially when you don't work those things out. Now, I know people that are serving God now. They're divorcing God. Jesus them in a mighty way, but they love God. They're doing what they need to do. I get it. I understand it. So that was there so that we can understand the seriousness of our covenant of salvation with God. Somebody say amen. All right. Uh, then he's going to go on. He's going to talk about the rich man and Lazarus. i got to hurry. And uh, now, once again, this was not the Lazarus from Bethany. That Lazarus, Mar Mary and Martha's sister, were rich. This man was not. And uh, we know that it's talking about uh, a parable, I think a story, uh, where a man goes to hell. He's on fire, whatever. He's suffering. He looks across a chasm. There's Abraham's bosom. There's Lazarus. He's begging uh, the Lord to let him come over with a drop of water. This hell is about a terrible place. Hell is a terrible place. So don't think you're going to just go party in hell and have a good time. You won't. Uh, I don't even get into that. But here's what I really want to say about this. When we, that was before Jesus uh, resurrected. People, the, so, the spirit of man went to a place uh, in paradise called Abraham's bosom. Today, because Christ uh, has resurrected, he has made the way to the Father. In fact, let me give you 2 Corinthians 5 8. Here's what it says We are confident. Everybody say confident. confident. And I say, and will, you need to be confident today. You need to understand this. And we are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So what that's saying is when we die today, our spirits are going to go immediately ushered into the presence of Jesus Christ. So uh, Jesus goes on and uh, he talks about offenses and how they're going to come and how to forgive people. He talked about the mustard seed of faith. Uh, and then Jesus' ministry in Perea is interrupted by the death of a good friend, Lazarus. Let me just show you a couple pictures here. We all know the story. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, this is a picture of well, where they say Lazarus' tomb was. Bill and Sandra know this well. My wife does. They've been there. They've been in this. You go down these steps into a, uh, into a tomb area, and uh, there's a, uh, like a little cave up inside of there with a hole in the wall above it, and inside of there, and you almost got to get on your hands and knees to get in there, uh, but I crawled back. It's just really claustrophobic and weird. But uh, I had gone back back behind there. And uh, then uh, Pastor Mark will will do a teaching because uh, he leads the, the tour groups. And go ahead and put that next picture up there. And he will do it from the soul hole. This is called the soul hole. What they do is they put dead people in the grave. And there's this hole there. And they say that the spirit or the soul will come up and come out of that hole. And uh, it's just a, a Jewish thing. Uh, but Jesus... Uh, when he was there during his time, it said that he went into the tomb or he was at the tomb, and this is what he was doing. He had Lazarus was dead over here, and he had all the live people there, and he stood between them. And the whole story here is that Jesus stands between life and death. How good is that? He's the one that stands between life and death. And uh, so when you get to Israel, you need to go there and check that out. It's very, very good. I don't have time, but there's a lot of teaching there. In John 11, I'm getting ready to close out today. In John 11, 25 and 26, and Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Come on. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Come on. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe uh, thou this. And so he's saying, listen. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the one that gives life. I, I'm, and this is before he died. He was, you know, prophesying about, I'm going to go and conquer death, hell, and the grave so that you can live. And so uh, after this, Jesus is going to withdraw to uh, Ephraim and uh, go ahead and put up John 11, 54. And uh, let me give this to you. I'm going to read this out as I close out today. I apologize for the uh, lower third on top of the... Uh, uh, verse there, but you can get it. Uh, John 11, 
54 through 57, Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near the wilderness into the city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. So it's the spring. The Passover feast is drawing near. And he goes on, he says, And he went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus and spake among them, Selves as they stood in the temple, what think ye that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priest and the Pharisees had given a command that if any man knew where he was, that he should be uh, uh, shown it and that they might take him. So what's going on here is uh, Jesus is going to go in Jerusalem. It's going to be his last trip. We're going to pick up on that. We're going to slow things down a little bit. We're going to take uh, the days of the weeks and we're going to really get uh, detailed uh, in the next couple of weeks, about how that week transpires. So Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. He knows he's getting ready to die. His face is there. He's preparing himself for this, but he still has a lot more he's going to do. So I pray that you would join us again next week. And uh, man, it's been a fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, series here. I'm praying that you glean something from this. There's so much information. I want to encourage you to go back, get the notes, download them. You'll have those uh, for future references. And uh, that, that will be a blessing to you. Amen. So let me pray for you today. Lord, I thank you right now, God, that your word has gone forth today. And God, we're blessed, God, to hear these words and to hear the words of our master and to begin to walk in his steps, Lord, that we can know his life as life was given so that we could have life and abundant life. So, Lord, we just thank you. I pray for all those that are watching, God, that you would bless them now. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Well, we hope to see you next week. God bless you. Until then, may the Lord walk with you and uh, have a great week. Amen.